and the podium to you. Thanks, Dr. Friedman. As you said, as the fellow representatives on the Grand Rounds Committee, Tony and I sought out nominations for speakers from our co-fellows, and there was a resounding vote for Dr. Athena Pappas, and we are very lucky to have her join us here today. Dr. Pappas is the Director of Lifespan Cardiovascular Institute at Rhode Island, Miriam, and Newport Hospitals, and is Chief of Cardiology and Professor of Medicine at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University. She received a Bachelor of Science degree from Brown and a Doctor of Medicine from the University of Wisconsin. She completed her residency in internal medicine at the University of Wisconsin and fellowship in cardiovascular medicine at the University of Chicago. And I'll now pass it over to Tony. It's a real honor to have Dr. Pappas. She's held numerous leadership roles within the American College of Cardiology, including chair of the Women in Cardiology section, chair of the ECC annual scientific sessions in 2015, chair of the ACC section steering committee and chair of the governance committee. She's also served on the ACC board of governors as governor and president of the ACC Rhode Island chapter. She's currently a guest editor in chief for Jack and importantly, she just finished her term as the president of the ACC having just passed the torch a month, a month ago. Dr. Papa's clinical and research focus involves valvular heart disease, echocardiography and heart disease in women during pregnancy. We're uh, excited to hear her speak on the sex specific risk factors and approach in cardiovascular disease. Well, thank you, um, Catherine and Tony for that kind introduction. And it's really my uh, distinct pleasure and honor to be here with all of you. And um, I wish we could be in person. I know that we will be someday. So um, I hope to make this interactive. Um, I'll uh, review some of the sex-specific cardiovascular risk factors and approach to women because it's a rapidly changing field um, and then look forward to uh, a good discussion. Um, as was mentioned, make sure if I can make these go. I don't have any pertinent disclosures. See, I've got the unmute working. Let's see if I can get the slides to work. There we go. Excellent. Um, nothing pertinent to the <clears throat> talk at hand. Um, that may proceed. So I thought it's often easiest to start with a case um, as we spend a lot of our lives uh, thinking about our patients. And this was a, a middle-aged young woman who I met uh, some years ago. Um, this is her past medical history, social history, family history exam, and uh, she had presented with acute coronary syndrome. And as you can see from the angiogram, she did indeed have a, a significant uh, LAD disease. And uh, she came to me afterwards and said, I don't understand why me, I'm young and I'm healthy. Um, so hopefully we'll have some answers, though I'm sure everyone has some pretty good clues already. So over the next um, uh, few minutes to an hour, I hope to look through some of the emerging trends um, in cardiovascular disease to set the stage and then take a deeper dive on what our guidelines and guidance has as far as uh, women in particular for risk assessment. And what are some of the difference uh, that we can see already uh, as far as risk factors, both tra uh, traditional risk factors that may be more prominent in women and some uh, more unique to women that have been uh, more recently dubbed risk enhancers. And then where do we go in the future? How do we get some implementation of what we've learned over this uh, time period? Um, again, no news to this world, but certainly cardiovascular disease mortality varies by region. This is from the World Health Organization, and you can see that uh, for women, uh, the cardiovascular mortality varies significantly, uh, say, for example, in North America uh, compared to Russia or um, uh, Middle Africa. Unfortunately, similarly, we see a significant variation uh, regionally in the United States as well. Uh, with significant age-adjusted uh, mortality rates um, varying, again, across the US. It's more than just region and gender, uh, but also race. So um, we do know that the, there's a higher population-adjusted cardiovascular mortality uh, for women as compared to men. And then from the very recent um, AHA uh, statistics, higher mortality in the first year after an MI for those in this younger age group, such as a patient I quoted, with a difference between white males and females and an equally 
uh, alarming difference between um, white and black, and then black males and black females. This persists when we look at mortality at five years as well for this younger age group. Again, the difference uh, in gender and the significant difference in race. And even when we look at this older age group, uh, 65 to 74, the trend uh, persists uh, and perhaps is even more dramatic. Not all bad news. Uh, I thought I'd show this slide from a, a recent uh, publication by Dr. Krumholz, which looked at over 4 million patients from the Medicare database um, so a, a very specific group, but the 20 year trends in general have been good. So we've done a good job in 30 day mortality with a lot of the efforts aimed at appropriate guideline directed medical therapy, early reperfusion and closing this gap by age, looking at the young to, to older, um, by those that are dual eligible. So Medicare, Medicaid, just Medicare. Uh, by race and by gender. So some good news, we're certainly closing the gap over the last 20 years. What's this difference in, in, in age? Well, this is an interesting um, way to look at this, I think, and this is from uh, Dr. Barry Meritz's uh, work, but showing that the rate of first MI in women as compared to men uh, is different uh, with men being higher. Here's the rate per thousand and increases with age, but the mortality um, post MI between men and women uh, is higher being twofold, the odds ratio being two in the younger age group and comes down to one as we age. So a difference in the relative risk of death being highest for women in this younger age group. More concerning is that we also see when we look back at some of this trends that we've seen, as I showed, um, a decrease in mortality uh, for both men and women with a closing of the gap uh, for those that are younger, uh, older, and then over 65. If we look a little closer here, the trend uh, for this younger age women has been pretty flat for a very long time. So why, why this significant difference? Well, we can explore some of this, uh, biologic factors, differential effects of risk factors, difference in social and economic supports, and uh, systemic racism and sexism underpinning or intersecting with some of these factors. On the flip side, we can look at some of the cardiovascular risk factors that vary by race as well as um, age and gender. Here's age-adjusted prevalence of cardiovascular health, the flip side, obviously, of, of risk. Uh, again, from the recent uh, strokes and heart statistics, blue being ideal, red being intermediate, and yellow being uh, poor health risk. So looking at smoking, body mass index, physical activity, the difference between um, white, black, Asian, and Mexican-American, you can see that a number of the risk factors, uh, not well controlled, for example, not doing well with healthy diet, um, and it varies between the race within the US. So more work to do here, but some of the uh, underlying issues may be uh, getting at the risk factors. Furthermore, uh, it's become increasingly apparent to all of us that the social determinants of health are incredibly important and that healthcare only accounts for about 20%. Um, access to care, quality of services, but it's these other factors, behavioral, uh, health factors, physical environment, and socioeconomic factors that have a significant effect on health outcomes. Furthermore, um, this paper articulated some of the very specific social determinants of health. This is uh, as identified by the Kaiser Family Foundation, economic stability, physical environment, education, food, social context, and the healthcare system. And what are some of the quality and equitable healthcare gaps in women that may account for some of the sex differences. And we know that the socioeconomic disadvantage seems to disproportionately influence women uh, and historically underrepresented uh, groups and or minorities. Well, it's not all grim, at least being aware of these differences, we can certainly le look at them and try to attack them. So uh, again, from uh, Dr. Shaw's paper, looking at the reference population, diverse women and the avoidable morbidity or mortality. And what's the approach? A number of different steps can be taken to try to close that gap, uh, whether it's patient-centeredness, 
barriers to care, uh, both looking at research as we're talking about, and then health system redesign. So achieving that equity, closing that gap requires not only um, some of the, say, door to balloon time we've worked on um, that sort of raises all boats, but a real focused attention on the social determinants of health. This is one example uh, as a CDC tool. It's uh, from uh, NIM.edu, uh, which is a tool that can easily be used for screening for health-related social needs. Um, and it could be utilized in the uh, clinic or office setting uh, rather than saying the patient is non-compliant, uh, which we've tried to avoid, but trying to understand that other 80% uh, that may be impeding uh, a patient's care. So, I think the emerging trends help frame the conversation uh, where we are with uh, cardiac outcomes and uh, what do some of the guidelines and guidance help us uh, to work this forward? Well, about 10 years ago, um, the AHA came out with uh, effectiveness-based guidelines for the prevention of cardiovascular disease in women. And here in that uh, paper was really Quite honestly, I think for the first time, framing the high risk, at risk with new risk factors in here and ideal risk, focusing on women in particular. And you see that we started to talk about over 10 years ago, some unique risk factors, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about. But prior to that, um, gender, or I should say sex specific differences were not necessarily uh, brought forward. How about our more recent guidelines? So this is the uh, recent uh, blood cholesterol guidelines. And you can see that um, here's, if from the online supplements, you can see the supporting documents, but recommendations specific to women. And in particular, looking at premature menopause, pregnancy associated disorders, when we're considering lifestyle intervention or potential benefits of statin therapy. So bringing forward some sex specific recommendations. What about our primary prevention guidelines uh, from 2019? Again, um, bringing forward premature um, metabolic syndrome and menopause and also race and ethnicity. So again, we're starting to bring forward some risk enhancing factors that we can bring into the conversation um, and we have now embedded in our guidelines. So an awareness uh, and a focused attention to that. Bringing this all together, um, a very nice recent paper looking at uh, cardiovascular risk factors in women. Thinking about the traditional risk factors, um, initially started from the Framingham Heart Study and what might be different in women in particular. Some other factors is we're starting to learn more, whether it's adverse pregnancy outcomes, autoimmune disorders, kidney disease, and then specific hormonal factors that are unique to women, including the social determinants of health as we talked about, psychologic risk factors, perhaps inflammation is the common pathway leading to endothelial dysfunction, atherosclerosis, and ultimately cardiovascular disease. But it's, um, I think, a, a nice way to frame uh, these different factors as we start to think through this. So here we are, we've looked at what the guidelines say, and uh, there are, we're beginning to have some spec sex specific recommendations embedded in those. Let's dig a little bit deeper into some of those coronary disease risk factors and what might be some unique features in women. Well, these are the traditional risk factors and I've starred those that uh, have some specific difference between men and women. Tobacco, um, the decline in smoking, unfortunately, has been slower in women in general and also in those with at lower socioeconomic uh, status and or education. It's estimated that up to half of ACS and MIs in middle-aged women are attributable to smoking. And importantly, smoking has a 25% greater cardiovascular risk <clears throat> in women compared to men. And this is from one meta-analysis. This is shown graphically in this smaller study, but it's a powerful uh, visual, I think. And this is a, a group um, from Finland that looked at uh, age of first MI when we look at women, those who were non-smokers, age at first MI was 79, those who were smokers was 60. So a significant difference. Similar for men, but less prominent um, a gap, 71 and 64 with a great deal of overlap. So again, smoking may be a more prominent risk factor, a more powerful risk factor in women. The problem uh, is more 
prominent now with the uh, use of e-cigarettes that we've seen a significant decline in smoking overall, uh, particularly we still see in this younger age group, about half have declined, but we still see a marked increase in e-cigarettes, particularly with targeted um, advertising to women and young girls. Hypertension, again, uh, very prominent risk factors we're well aware. This is from Dr. Wenger's uh, review paper, deaths attributable um, in women. And you can see that in blue, hypertension is the most prominent risk factor for cardiovascular disease and is more prominent in women. This is looking uh, also well known to all of us, the increase in prevalence of hypertension in men compared to women, increasing with age, and women, unfortunately, catch up as they get older uh, and surpass men. Uh, this is not something we want to win at, at the age over 60. So again, an increase in prevalence with age and for women in particular, a significant increase in prevalence later in life. Furthermore, hypertension prevalence and control varies by both sex and race. This is again uh, from the same, same uh, data brief and you can see that for men and women, um, there is a higher prevalence in uh, non-Hispanic Blacks in men and women. And furthermore, the degree of control of hypertension uh, decreases um, and varies significantly by race in both men and in women. Sorry, I missed Hispanic there. <laughs> What's some of the good news, but still one of our greatest challenges is the, <laughs> I love this cartoon, the non-pharmacologic interventions. Not only, not only do we know that uh, weight, diet, and physical activity have a significant effect on hypertension uh, with weight contributing to up to 30% of um, hypertension, but also weight loss lowers blood pressure. Same with diet being related uh, to high blood pressure but that an improvement in diet can lead to a significant reduction in blood pressure. And same with physical inactivity, increasing risk twofold, but the converse that we can see a reduction in blood pressure with exercise. Uh, for those of us that are seeing patients, we're well aware of this and it would be a blockbuster drug if we could get everybody to comply, the challenge. And I do like uh, dark chocolate. What about cholesterol? Um, you know, as we dig into this, as in many things, it's uh, not so simple when we peel the on onion back. So we do know that for women, uh, the risk of coronary artery disease and infarction increases with, particularly with an increase in triglycerides or a lower HDL. And this in particular, uh, overall in epidemiologic studies um, has a greater effect in women as compared to men. We also know that lowering LDL reduces events and death in women. And in the secondary prevention uh, from the clinical trialist meta-analysis, they did not see heterogeneity by gender. But recent data um, from the SWAN study, which uh, is a large uh, prospective study um, with a lot of diversity, looked at some difference in that during the menopause transition with a lot of data during the menopause transition that there's a change in hdl subclass and you can see the change in small medium and large particles there appears to be a change in concentration of the lipid content as you go from pre peri and postmenopausal, and a change in uh, cholesterol efflux capacity so that the particle size changes but their function may be different as women go through menopause. So just measuring HDL at a single point in time may not tell the whole story. What else? So to summarize that, postmenopausal women have more small HDL. Those large HDL converted to smaller particles by an increase in hepatic lipase activity. We know that estrogen inhibits hepatic lipase. Furthermore, menopause is associate, the association between HDL and cardiovascular disease, it may switch from being protective to harmful during the menopause transition. And this comes from data from both Mesa, SWAN, and the Los Angeles uh, study. So an increase in HDL is associated with an increase in IMT in these studies and an increase in stroke after menopause. Switching gears to diabetes, 
um, again, global, globally, women with diabetes uh, continues to increase, unfortunately. Uh, we know that approximately half are preventable with diet and exercise. And women seem to have a 50% excess relative risk of cardiovascular disease with diabetes. And this comes from uh, Dr. Yusuf's Interheart study. Lastly, though, the majority of mortality from diabetes is due to cardiovascular disease. Both men and women, when interviewed, do not consider cardiovascular disease as a possible complication. So a lot of opportunity for further education of our patients. An older slide, but it shows graphically uh, the trend, not only regional variation in obesity, uh, but also uh, temporal changes in the wrong direction. But this significant increase um, in patients that are obese and uh, concomitant increase in diabetes uh, over time. It's not any better today. So let's come back to the uh, study um, and review by Dr. Mosca, looking at guidance for women in cardiovascular disease. And you can see that obesity, particularly central obesity was called out and metabolic syndrome made very prominent over 10 years ago. Again, we know that um, obesity contributes to and compounds other risk factors, central obesity in particular. For every increase um, in BMI, we get an increase in risk. And again, it's a higher cardiovascular risk in women compared to men. So some of these risk factors, though we know that they are prominent in their traditional risk factors, some have a greater role in women compared to men. Metabolic syndrome, just to review, uh, you have to have three of these five criteria, abdominal obesity, as you can see being one of them, and the greater loss of physical functioning contributes to greater weight gain, contributes to insulin resistance and hypertension. Just one study which noted uh, in women in particular that uh, metabolic syndrome is not benign, and this is looking at freedom from death over time and freedom from MACE over time in uh, normal metabolic syndrome and diabetes. And you can see that those with metabolic syndrome fall intermediate between normal and diabetic patients. More work to be done. So we've talked about some of the traditional risk factors that may have more prominent role in women. What about some of the non-traditional risk factors uh, that may have unique features? So psychosocial uh, disorders and also autoimmune disorders. Well, this is again uh, just one study, and this is population attributable risk on the left from the Interheart study, uh, which was over 15,000 patients um, it, across the globe. So uh, a lot of diversity embedded in this, male and female. And we look at psychosocial here, 33%. But when we look at the difference, it was 45% for men and 29% for women. So again, psychosocial uh, effects and contribution greater in women than in men. These are just two studies to emphasize that point. This is from the nurse's health study. And this was in women with no cardiovascular disease. Depression was an independent predictor of death and cardiovascular death. And that women with established cardiovascular disease, marital stress was associated with a threefold increased risk of recurrent cardiovascular events. No, no comment on uh, marital. <laughs> Right. What about autoimmune disorders? Again, um, for example, RA, SLE, and antiphospholipid antibody are associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Twofold increase in those with rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, and that is eightfold higher in women that are younger, under 45 years old. It appears that inflammation is the common pathway. This increased risk appears to correlate with disease flares, and it has also been shown to correlate with uh, sed rate. Both of these disorders, lupus in particular, is more common in women, <clears throat> so it may compound the effect for women. It is therefore considered a risk enhancing in the primary uh, factor in considering for primary prevention for women. This is coming back to the uh, ACC AHA prevention guidelines, looking at risk enhancing factors for the discussion, and chronic inflammatory conditions, psoriasis, rheumatoid, lupus, or HIV and AIDS should be considered in our discussion and patient um, assessment.
We've talked about traditional and non-traditional risk, risk factors. Let's spend a little more time talking about female uh, sex-specific risk factors. Uh, also, those that are starred have been called out in the recent guidelines because the, the data is powerful enough to be described as risk enhancers. So thinking about the reproductive lifespan of women, uh, menopause in particular, and adverse pregnancy outcomes, preeclampsia, preterm birth, and gestational diabetes. A very recent um, AHA scientific statement calling out this menopausal transition and cardiovascular risk. Again, a time for uh, early prevention and working together with our colleagues uh, in other disciplines. Let's look at some of the detail. Uh, thinking more about the reproductive lifespan and cardiovascular risk, uh, those that have a shorter duration of reproductive lifespan seem to have an increased risk. Early menarche, uh, some inconsistent data, but perhaps a U-shaped uh, response. It can be confounded by obesity and diabetes. And so the data on early menarche is not as clear. Early menopause, uh, which is defined as a loss of ovarian function before the age of 40, which does occur in approximately 1% of women in the US, is associated with an increased cardiovascular risk and all-cause mortality. And this is from a number of studies. Let's talk a little bit more about that to understand this. Well, we know that women's risk of cardiovascular disease increases after menopause. And the piece that's concerning is, is it age or hormone related? We know that early menopause, surgical or natural, is associated with an increased risk and all-cause mortality. But more recently, it does appear that this risk is bi-directional meaning that early menopause may be a marker of both reproductive and general health or somatic aging. And women with cardiovascular risk factors tend to have earlier menopause. There's also, <clears throat> which I'll show you, uh, genetic pleiotropy. That is that there's genetic variants associated with both early menopause and cardiovascular risk factors. More challenging to, to tease out uh, cause and effect. And some epigenetic studies more recently suggest some co-inheritability with the age of menopause and uh, accelerating aging. <clears throat> Here's just a couple to talk about cause or consequence. Sorry, let me take a drink of water. Well, a number of cardiac risk factors have been shown to account for potentially cause, but are associated with early menopause. From the Framingham study, higher uh, total cholesterol, uh, greater weight and blood pressure are associated with an earlier age of the menopause transition. An increase in cardiac risk factors is also associated with premature menopause uh, and CHIP um, has been associated with premature menopause and with coronary disease. And this is from some uh, interesting and recent work using the uh, UK Biobank, uh, Dr. Honenberg, who's at uh, MGH. Again, premature menopause has been associated with accelerated aging, as I mentioned, in one study looking at uh, one marker of an epigenetic clock, DNA methylation showed not only co-inheritability, but that this was increased in patients that had had bilateral uh, oophorectomy and decreased uh, by twofold in those who were on hormone replacement therapy. This is from the SWAN study, and I'm gonna show you a little more detail because I think we're getting into some better specificity. So those risk factors that seem to change in a linear fashion over time, hypertension, insulin, blood sugar, and weight, um, are probably more age-related. Those that have a sharp inflection point at the menopause transition, lipids, uh, in particular total cholesterol, LDL, and APOB, uh, with a marked change at one year after the menopause, and as I mentioned, the HDL particle distribution and meta, uh, metabolic syndrome, and that is more pronounced in African-Americans. <clears throat> this is from the SWAN study, just showing graphically uh, that change in time, and it's because of the specificity of data, uh, pre, peri, and post-menopause that, that we've, um, this group's been able to discern this. So again, uh, a diverse group uh, in the SWAN study who all began in the pre-menopause uh, period of time the change within one year uh, was notable. Um, here you can see the marked inflection in LDL, linear changes in insulin, blood pressure, and LPA, um, 
the prior epidemiologic studies putting this in context did not have frequent measures and did not have concurrent measures of these other covariates, but did show this increase in triglycerides and LDL in postmenopausal women, but not this inflection point. So I think we're learning importantly, differentiating aging, uh, biologic aging um, from actual menopausal um, correlates. Let's move a little bit into pregnancy. And again, AHA and ACOG uh, came out with a recommendation to look at risk factor identification. We have a window of time when women have uh, increased or adverse pregnancy outcomes to work together with our colleagues. So what do we know about adverse pregnancy outcomes? Well, unfortunately it's common. Um, 10 to 20% of women may um, have adverse pregnancy outcomes. We know that those that have uh, adverse outcomes have an increased risk of future cardiovascular disease, anywhere from two to four fold. And ACOG recommends risk factor screening at three months and others recommend at six months postpartum. Uh, we have introduced a postpartum uh, risk clinic here at Brown in, co in collaboration with uh, the Maternal Fetal Medicine Group. And the goal is to, the, the women have young babies and it's a challenge, but um, to use this opportunity to try to get at some primary prevention for these higher risk women. The um, overlapping etiology appears to be both placental and endothelial dysfunction. Um, cardiologists aren't used to looking at vascular remodeling in the placenta, but normal placentation requires that um, the, the um, endothelium is replaced so that you get a low um, resistance system um, with the spiral arteries. With abnormal placent placentation, there is a lack of that, an increase in pressure, and it's um, abnormal uh, cellular activity and flow. So there appears to be <clears throat> some shared vascular factors between preeclampsia and cardiovascular disease, per, perhaps not well-established pathologic lesion, uh, endothelial dysfunction, vasomotor dysfunction. Uh, we did a study about 10 years ago looking at um, flow-mediated dilation in women who were going through the menopause transition. And those that had more symptoms of uh, atypical chest pain, palpitation, and hot flashes had more abnormal flow median dilation. So again, a link perhaps between uh, symptoms, uh, cardiovascular disease and endothelial function. What about shared metabolic factors? Again, preeclampsia uh, as the most prominent and cardiovascular disease. Uh, they have shared increased risk with those of insulin resistance, hyperlipidemia, uh, inflammatory cascades are noted to be activated. Uh, and homocystinuria, anemia, sorry. And the risk factors are shared as well. So those with preeclampsia and those with cardiovascular disease uh, have an increase in uh, a number of cardiovascular risk factors, and it is found to be increased independently in uh, those of black race. So let's look a little bit at the details that underpin some of this so that we can understand that. So the complication of pregnancy may predict higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So preeclampsia occurs in six to 8% of pregnancies. Uh, it predicts a fourfold increase of hypertension postpartum and a twofold increase risk independent of the hypertension of coronary disease and cerebrovascular disease. Stillbirth alone show a two to two and a half fold increased risk of MI in the future, miscarriage showing an increased risk of myocardial infarction as well. This is just one study looking at patients survival um, over 25 years. Uh, in red is no preeclampsia and a term delivery versus this highest risk group that had preeclampsia and a preterm delivery with a significant hazard uh, for death from cardiovascular disease. This is from a large Finnish cohort of over 10,000 women, which showed that any elevation of blood pressure in pregnancy predicted higher risk of cardiovascular disease. They had over 40 years of follow-up and were able to adjust for a number of confounding risk factors. And again, they showed an increased risk of ischemic heart disease, myocardial infarction, heart failure, and stroke 
This is this paper displayed graphically. It is one minus survival. And so the normal tense of patients are displayed on the bottom, but you can see a graded response, a negative response in survival of any cardiovascular disease, myocardial infarction or myocardial infarction deaths from those that are normal tensive to those that had superimposed preeclampsia and eclampsia on top of hypertension. So a significant difference in disease, infarction and deaths. This is um, an excellent meta-analysis, which looked at a number of studies looking at ischemic heart disease and the relative risk of those uh, with preeclampsia on fatal and non-fatal ischemic events. And you can see that it's at least a two-fold increased risk of cardiovascular events later in life. Probably the best study that really um, dissect some of this was the uh, CHAMP study done um, with over a million women up in Canada. And adverse pregnancy outcomes were associated with a twofold increased risk of MACE. But importantly, by adverse pregnancy outcome, they, they had predominantly preeclampsia. Um, but here is um, placental syndromes, which included abruption. And they dissected out those that also had um, fetal abnormalities, such as fetal loss or uh, low birth weight. So if they had adverse pregnancy outcome and neonatal dysfunction, they had increased risk long-term. And those that had cardiac risk factors and adverse pregnancy outcome had a three to 10-fold risk. So shown graphically here, um, and they, maternal placental syndrome uh, was the term they used, uh, overall increased risk if they had uh, pre-pregnancy hypertension and uh, placental syndrome, increase in risk, significant increase. Same with adding diabetes to the placental syndrome, di obesity, dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome with more features and tobacco abuse. So what we're seeing is this uh, compounding effect of not only the abnormal uh, placental function, but the cardiac risk factors. <clears throat> This is an excellent, I think, summary from a great review um, in Jack two years ago, looking at this role of adverse pregnancy outcome and trying to understand uh, the intersection here of this risk factor cluster. As we mentioned, placental vascular abnormalities, um, so just some of which are uh, listed here, but leading to placental malperfusion and perhaps systemic abnormalities. And with this adverse pregnancy outcome, direct abnormal cardiac mechanics have been shown in echocardiographic and other studies, coronary endothelial dysfunction, and loss of global arterial compliance, which we studied over 20 years ago. Long-term risk leading to overt cardiovascular disease. So trying to discern the intersection of risk factors, placental vascular dysfunction, um, direct effects, uh, leading long-term to vascular disease. Well, what's some of our way forward here? Well, if we think of pregnancy in the context of women's health across the lifespan, thinking about preconception care and prevention from pediatrics to internal medicine, prenatal care, and, and increasingly we're talking about the fourth trimester, this window of time when, cardio when as a team, cardiology uh, internists and obstetrics can work together, particularly to identify high-risk women, to identify some of the cardiovascular risk factors uh, to intercede and change uh, the outcome. Well, let's uh, come back to where we started um, with our patient, um, my 45-year-old uh, young woman who presented with acute coronary syndrome. Well, <clears throat> She wasn't perfectly healthy as she had thought. Uh, if we'd asked, and we should ask about uh, obstetric history, she was G2P2, but it had preeclampsia that put her at increased risk. She was taking vitamin E, which does not have any shown benefit. She was recently divorced and when asked was undergoing significant psychosocial stress. She had quit tobacco 10 years ago, emphasizing the importance and the, <clears throat> the effect of tobacco on young women. Her father had had an MI at a young age. Family history uh, is powerful in both men and women. 
Uh, her height and weight uh, put her in the obese category. She was hypertensive, newly diagnosed, and her HDL was low. So the real question for our lady here, why had we not present, prevented this? So as we come to the end here, let me summarize what we've learned and hopefully what are some future directions and uh, goals for implementation. Well, we've seen some static mortality trends. Uh, so we need to raise awareness and uh, redouble our efforts on primary prevention focus. Some of the efforts and significant changes we've seen have been around um, early mortality with in-hospital uh, reperfusion and guideline-directed medical therapy. We need more research focused on sex-based mechanisms and being more inclusive of a diverse and broad group of women. We need to refocus our efforts on health equity and the social determinants of health, be able to ask those questions and work with other team members to address and close that gap. We need living guidelines and to depend on guidance. Uh, we need updates to include these risk enhancers, and we need to educate not only providers, but patients about the importance of risk enhancers. We're going to need more research focusing and shifting from observational. We have a lot of observational data, which I showed today, but focusing, which is more costly, on implementation and true outcomes. And then as we look at these unique risk factors in women, we need to work on more collaborative um, studies and programs with our gynecologist and primary care to educate and better treat women. I think we'll see in the next five years trying to sort out reproductive versus chronologic or somatic aging uh, so that we can uh, make more specific and sex specific recommendations. And then this research needs to refocus and double our efforts on the intersection of both vascular factors and risk factors, particularly around pregnancy uh, and abnormal or normal placentation. So with that, uh, I'll close. I'll thank you for our attention. I'd like to show this picture because it was a couple of years ago. It was the last time we had uh, our cardiology faculty and fellows, some of, most of them, uh, gathered together uh, in person. And I look forward to when we can do that again. And I can see you again as well. And I want to thank the fellows for inviting me. It's really an honor to be with you today. And I'm happy to take questions. Let me open the chat box too. Thank you very much, uh, Kripapas, for that terrific talk. Um, it looks like uh, Aria uh, would like to start off uh, with a question. Are you going to mute yourself? I'm unmuted, but you actually stopped my video sharing. So I don't want to be impolite, <laughs> but I cannot have my video on. Okay, great talk. I really enjoyed it. And your emphasis on metabolic syndrome was uh, very much in place and important. And um, uh, But the question is actually, the, what is metabolic syndrome? How are these all diverse traits associated? What unifies them? And in that case, if you understand the underlying cause that actually unifies all these diverse phenotypes, and in, and in some parts actually very much uh, counterintuitive uh, phenotypes, such as you know, triglyceride elevation is actually induced by insulin. However, we have insulin resistance. And the question is that, how are we linking hypertension with lipid abnormalities? Is that the obesity or is that insulin resistance? Because in that case, we can target it better rather than just kind of attack, uh, attacking each trait individually, but looking at the underlying cause that unifies them. And I think a lot of effort should be kind of made in this area, but I don't know what your thoughts are in this area. No, I think it's a it's a very good point. And it's this constellation of traits, as you mentioned, which have been tagged metabolic syndrome. Um, and they do have um, confounding effects when I think that's what you're you're getting at as well. Which of those are more uh, prevalent or the ones to target? Um, I, I don't know that we can I can answer that. But I think looking at that issue of the intersection um, with insulin resistance and some of the underpinning, which may be physical inactivity, um, as well as some hormonal factors, I think is the place we're going to have to go. But 
whether that cluster is real um, or just a, a cluster, but we do know that um, it increases the risk. I don't know, to your point, with just observational data, we can discern uh, which of those pieces to tackle first. I think genetics would actually help a lot by this survey. That's my opinion. Yeah, as we learn more, we, we're hopeful on that, right? Some of the, uh, the uh, UK biobanking and some of the work with uh, the Framingham biobanking that we're seeing is um, di discerning some of that. Um, not my area of expertise, but it, it's not always as easy as it seems. For example, that nice study um, that looked at um, CHIP, for example, is interesting, but what, what the causation is and the link is a little more challenging. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And there's a, a question in the chat from uh, Jeff Bender. He said, based on the Women's Health Initiative subgroup of younger women, uh, the ALIGHT and DOPS studies should hormone replacement therapy started in the early menopausal transition period make its way into prevention guidelines? Yeah. So, so Athena, I, I would oh. just, um, sorry, I, I would just uh, interject here. I wanted to thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, and also uh, just say that I noticed that you avoided this murky area of HRT and in, in menopausal transition period. And, and uh, you know, there's been this quandary for years. I mean, my group studied the beneficial effects okay. of estrogen on, on vascular function in vitro and in organ cultures, but we were sort of separate from the clinical guidelines um, or lack thereof. So I just wondered if you could comment because I think the data are growing and accumulating that this is of benefit. Yeah, Jeff, I agree with you. It's, um, and as you're getting at, it's really a talk in and of itself. Um, I, I took out some of those slides intentionally. Um, so, you know, it was a very dichotomous look at the original uh, women's health group, right? So it was yes, no, good, bad. Um, but a more careful look and more recent, as you mentioned, in, in some of these trials have certainly shown that when initiated early, um, there is a benefit and we know, you know, mechanistically it made sense that there's estrogen receptors on, on an endothelial, on an, the endothelium and there's endothelial function and some pleiotropic effects. So it makes perfect sense. The question is, do we need better data to recommend? I would suggest at a minimum, we need to be able to get the message out that it's not yes, no, good, bad that there is a window of time. And this is, I think we're working with our, our obstetric colleagues can help where uh, beginning hormone replacement therapy, particular not oral um, in some of the different types, mm -hmm. as you've mentioned in some of these studies come out as well, you know, using equine uh, estrogen replacement orally may have been part of the issue. So patch early on for a brief period of time in women who don't already have uh, risk factors, um, probably is the way to go. So I, I'm, I'm with you. I think at a minimum, getting rid of that stigma and looking at a more refined look at that. What do you think? I 100% agree. And, and many of our colleagues in the OBGYN community feel strongly about that. You know, they're stuck because they need to treat women often with peri and postmenopausal estrogens. And they come to us and say, are we doing something bad? And in the beginning, I said, I don't want to answer that question. But now I typically say, I don't think you are if you're using that, you know, correct window, uh, timing window. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe this is another statement that needs to come out just around that subject, to be honest. I agree. Um, hi, this is Matt Berg. Um, and uh, I also want to thank you for really a really wonderful uh, presentation. And as a clinical psychologist who's been working and researching in cardiovascular behavioral medicine for many years, I really appreciated your focus on the behavioral component and on the adherence issue. Um, you know, at the same time, in your presentation of the interheart data, you know, one of the other factors that interheart found to be highly predictive uh, and with a high odds ratio was the psychosocial index, which was comprised of indices of depression and life stress. And, it, and, and the risk associated with this was as high as just about any other factor 
um, including APO, um, and was uh, more, more impactful for women. Similarly, um, uh, in the nurses health study, we know about the contribution of uh, lifetime trauma. And, you know, from other sources, we know about the, the high, much higher prevalence of lifetime trauma, particularly early life sexual trauma, um, uh, uh, you know, among women. And uh, as nurses health study has, has shown us is that this is also associated with increased inflammation and uh, broadly risk of incident cardiovascular disease. From Enriched and MHART, we know that traditional depression treatments uh, may not be as effective for women. Um, and we know from the Swedish experience that focusing on stress after a, an MI can be particularly uh, helpful for women and improve event-free survival. Um, at the same time, when I think about, you know, that early life trauma and the, uh, the, the, the early menarche that we're seeing among uh, young girls who are exposed to this, um, and, and your focus on that adolescent adult transition as the period when we have the pediatrician, the internist, potentially the cardiologist involved. Um, and with the implementation focus, what it, what it brings me to wonder about and what your thoughts are is about the use of an, of a, of an integrated healthcare or an integrated delivery of care, particularly around cardiovascular disease prevention, where it's not just you know, the cardiologist, internist, uh, pediatrician, um, OBGYN, but that with so many of these factors uh, associated with behavior and stress and lifetime exposures, um, shouldn't there be a role? Shouldn't we be uh, testing implementation models where we're, we're having integrated care that involves a behavioral health specialist, whether it's, you know, around a, a, a screening for these factors um, looking at how we can treat these factors, even factors of adherence in the patients with established disease. And I, you know, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, well, it's hard to argue against that, isn't it? Um, and we had a recent um, seminar we did here at Brown and uh, one of the behavioral health um, speakers mentioned this intersection and described it as an allostatic load. Yes. That, um, uh, particularly people, it's this compounding effect. Uh, those that are in um, lower socioeconomic status, that don't have the same supports, that um, are more likely to have had uh, trauma, may be more likely to. So it is this compounding effect. And the inflammation seems to be the, the blanket we drop on top of everything. Um, there does seem to be perhaps a common pathway. But to your point, um, attacking each of those pieces as a group, and attack's probably the wrong word, but trying to treat and at least discover some of those earlier on. You know, we ask, internists have to ask if people wear their seatbelt and there's the laundry list of things they have to ask, but, um, and the depression screening at least is being done. So I think there's a beginning of that. I, I think the challenge is this gap from asking the question to doing something. And we still, and maybe it's late in the game. We know that treating patients, for example, um, with SSRIs post MI may or may not have an effect. So uh, to your point, how do we approach this window um, earlier so that we're preventing or treating, for example, uh, trauma or treating depression um, and stressors, um, particularly for people who are the more, most vulnerable. And how do we do that earlier to affect change in the lifetime? To me, it's a little like, um, we know that cholesterol is, is being deposited from age 20 on or maybe earlier. So why do we treat it at age 70? Uh, it's the same, I would say, for the psychosocial stressors. Um, and that's a little bit of a system issue and perhaps, unfortunately, a payer issue, right? So yes. um, seeing well, patients as a group is hard. <laughs> Yes, and and you know, with at least in the primary care context, the VA has figured it out. Yeah, yeah, and that might be the model. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you. And then there's some uh, additional questions uh, in the chat uh, function. Um, so uh, Rob uh, Adaran said, "I just mm -hmm. met a 37 year old patient with right now. It's probable uh, Ehlers Danlos." history, miscarriage, and exertional chest pain and dyspnea. In addition to looking for coronary endothelial dysfunction, what else would you do to lower risk? 
and uh, Dr. Spath sort of uh, uh, asked to expand on that um, to basically how can we better understand microvascular dis dysfunction and its contribution to chest pain syndromes, cardiovascular risk factors and outcomes. And just she's sort of adding a parenthetical that our, our traditional schema workup is based on a paradigm of obstructive heart disease, which is really more probably um, uh, consistently uh, uh, relevant for men. So should we have a separate workup for men versus women? Yeah, excellent question. And um, I think, you know, Harmony Reynolds' recent work and uh, Barry uh, Merritt's work prior to that with the WISE study really started to articulate that and, and separate out Minoka and some of these other subgroups. I don't know that it should be separate, but certainly trying to uh, understand, as we've learned, that obstructive disease is only one small piece, and it's it's the I'm sure there's uh, angiographers in the room right now, the interventionalists, but there's there's other methods of approach. So just the symptom, and for example, in this patient, uh, is an angiogram enough, or should we be looking at um, cardiac MRI where we can more finely discern uh, some of the issue around microvascular dysfunction um, and myocardial dysfunction, uh, as well as um, you know, trying to treat women, because we know that those that have disease but don't have obstructive disease have an intermediate risk. Their, their risks are not zero long-term. So I would agree. I don't think it's, again, a blanket approach that we should have a separate pathway, but just have a heightened awareness that women can have obstructive disease, obviously. Uh, but in addition, both men and women that have non-obstructive disease and microvascular dysfunction uh, you know, as you're talking about perhaps with this Ehlers-Danlos patient, though I'm more concerned about other issues with that one, um, we should have a more subtle approach. So, I, you know, in some ways it's similar to what we were just saying around um, psychosocial issues or around the hormone that uh, sort of our, our dichotomous approach might not be the best. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. If there's uh, no further questions, uh, just want to thank you again uh, for participating in our cardiovascular medicine grand rounds. It was an absolute pleasure. And thank you to thank the you. fellows for such a terrific uh, selection. And uh, take care, be well, and we'll see everyone next week. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure. Take care.